two days ago after practice, I was telling our guys, we got to get more ice tub guys. So to make it a point, I went out to cold tubs and poured down rain while I was out there with my hat on. But I'll get into cold tubs because coaches need fresh legs too. Hello, welcome to Always College Football. Today is Tuesday, August 9th. We hope you're enjoying the show wherever it is you're getting the show, whether that's on the ESPN YouTube channel or if you're here with us via podcast, whether it's Apple or if it's on Spotify, we really appreciate you being with us. He's Mark Kubiak. I'm Greg McElroy, and we have a great game plan for you today. We're going to visit with ACC champ. That's right. The Pitt Panthers head coach, Pat Narduzzi, will join us here on Always College Football. We're also going to look at the ACC Coastal in a division that has really had so much different representation in the ACC championship game. Seven different teams, by the way, in the Coastal have been to the ACC championship game. So we're going to look at a couple teams that might make it more difficult for Pitt to repeat. It might be a tough hill to climb. I think that division is actually significantly improved here in 2022. So without much further ado, let's get to it. He is the head coach of the Pitt Panthers. He's Pat Narduzzi. So thrilled to now be joined by the ACC Championship head coach, Pat Narduzzi of the Pitt Panthers. Coach, what's going on, my friend? Hey, not much. Just in the middle of camp. I appreciate you having me on today. Um, you know, it's a, it's a grind of camp, and our kids are currently down in the training, but you've got a nice text message from uh, our trainer saying our kids are taking advantage of a recovery day. They're down in the cold tubs, the hot tubs, you know, getting rubbed down, getting massages, so it's a, it's a great day. <laughs> It's a different breed of player now, isn't it? They're very focused. They all want to be great players. They all want to go pro. Like my idea of a recovery day during camp was going to the pool. And I'm not talking about the cold pool. I'm talking about the actual pool at our apartment. So it's changed a little, hasn't it? It really has. I mean, we've got so many more uh, things for our kids, resources for our kids, whether it's uh, you know the hot tubs, cold tubs, the, the you know our, our strength staff, you know five guys down there, Mike Stacchiotti runs that of just rolling our kids out. They got this thing called Big Bertha and it, and it's must weigh 60 pounds and they let the kids lay on their on their uh, stomachs and they roll these kids out and they love it. So, you know, it's just it's almost like a, you know, go to the spa. It's a spa day for our kids uh in every respect. Do you ever get down there and go to the spa yourself, coach? <laughs> you know what? I uh I don't. Um but coaches need to take care of themselves as well, but uh Two days ago after practice, I was telling our guys we got to get more ice tub guys. I mean, the DBs. I think the DBs are uh, you know they're um, they they have this thing about being in cold water. They're afraid of the cold and they don't want to go in there. And they run a lot during practice. So to make it a point, I went out in the cold tubs and it poured down rain while I was out there with my hat on. Um, but I'll get into cold tubs because coaches need fresh legs too. If I, I don't know, coach. I mean, I've seen you go through the shoots and stuff. Old defensive coordinator, like you want to get down there and fight a little bit in the trenches, don't you? No doubt about it. Try to get as dirty as we can. And I've always felt that way. I think when you, you know, when you're out there with the team, the team wants to know that you're not just sitting with the clipboard as a coach taking notes, that you're kind of involved in what's going on. And, um, you know, you coach a little bit. I don't like to step on our coach's toes, but I want to be involved. And, and I want to make sure that, you know, I wear, you know, I wear a sweat jacket out there, you know, when it's 98 degrees out there, try to just sweat <laughs> like they are. So I know what they're going through. So I want to, I want to feel the heat like they do. Oh, it's a dry heat though, right? That's what you guys all say up north. It's like, hey, it's a dry heat. Don't mind that it's 98, but it's a dry heat, right? <laughs> There's no dry heat up here. That's Arizona. <laughs> is dry, okay. Up here, it is a humid. You, you walk out the door and you, you I mean, you, you get wet even when it's, it's you know, 98 and sunny. I mean, you, it, you get soaked immediately. So it is humid. Uh, here in the Midwest. No, uh, what a wonderful place! I, I love that city this time of year, especially with the baseball and obviously leading up to Steelers camp, which you guys got going on. It's really a lot of fun to be up there at this time of year. I want to know, Coach. I mean, you're coming off a championship. Uh, it's a whole lot harder to go into the season ha wearing that target. So, what's the off season been like for the ACC champs? You know, Greg, we've had a we've had a great off season. Um, you know, I don't look at it as you know uh, is where the you know the target. Uh, or it changes what we do and what our, 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 you know, really our prescription and our medicine has been for, you know, how we got where we are. We're just going to keep doing what we do. Uh, I don't want our kids to look at it any different way. We're trying to win a championship in 22. We did it in 21. That's behind us. It was a different team. It was different players. I mean, there was a guy named Kenny Pickett, a quarterback. Um, you know, we, we've had some good defensive players. I mean, DeMar Mathis is with the Broncos as a corner. He was a lockdown. He was our best corner. Both of them did play in the bowl game. So I don't look at it as, you know, 
it's moving on to the next year. I think our kids have taken that. They want to do something different. They want to do it better. They want to be undefeated. And, you know, we're just trying to get better every day as a pit football team. You're one of the more interesting teams when I think about last year, Coach, because I think about what was, and it was a sensational season, winning the ACC, getting to the New Year's Six, having a chance to win your New Year's Six game, even though you guys were very much depleted going into that game. And yet you lose two games in the regular season by minimal points. Uh, to think what could have been versus what was, granted, thrilled with what you were, but it still feels like there's something to strive for here coming into this year. So have you noticed that sense where, yeah, hey, we're proud of what we did, but there's still a level of hunger surrounding pit football this year? It really is. I mean, you look at the Miami game that we lost at home. Um, we lost it. We felt like we had, you know, a, uh, a stop and on, a, on a coming out situation by their offense, you know, potentially a safety to end the game and, and win that game. And, and then we lost to Western Michigan. And our kids look at that and go, you know, we, we left a lot on the table and, you know, you end up being minus three in the turnover ratio against a really, really good mid-American conference team of Western Michigan. Um, you know, it's still, you know, you're minus three in the turnover ratio. You couldn't beat St. Mary's by the sea um, had had you, you have minus three. So you know, we got to get more turnovers. we got to protect the football. And, you know, our guys know they left a lot out there. And in 22, they want to try to fix it. Well, you bring, I mean, obviously starting the trench is a pretty good place to start uh, with what you bring back on both lines of scrimmage. Let's start with the offense. Knowing that you're so solid up front, what will that allow you to be offensively now heading into this year as compared to maybe what you were last year with a little uncertainty at that position? Yeah, I mean, our offensive line is deep. Uh, it wasn't as deep in the spring with some injuries, uh, but we've been you know, able to stay healthy so far. And we plan to stay healthy because we've got it really too deep on the offensive line. We feel like we've got some great uh, guys in that backup role that could go start any game. So we feel really uh, deep on the offensive line. They're more explosive up front. They're stronger than we were a year ago. When you look at our squats and our men benches, uh, we're in great shape. You know, we've had nobody go down with any heat exhaustion through camp. And it's been really, really extremely hot up here uh, in the, you know, the northern Midwest here. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's been a heck of a camp, and our offense line is going to be strong. I mean, uh, we've shown that we can pass protect. We want to be better, you know, at running the football, uh, which is something we've, you know we've worked on daily. And I think uh, we've got some tailbacks to do it with behind that offensive line. You were outspoken at ACC Media Days and obviously total respect for for Mark Whipple and what you guys had last year with the talent you had at wide receiver and at quarterback. It's understandable that you would kind of navigate in the direction of being a pass first style of attack. I know your bread and butter is about establishing the line of scrimmage, running the football, being balanced offensively, taking advantage of what the defense does. So how do you see the philosophy changing offensively? from Coach Whipple to Coach Signetti, who's now running the show on that side of the ball? Yeah, Greg, I think it, you know, it comes down to players and, and who your players are. And again, you know, with all due respect, you, you're, you're a fool not to throw the ball when you got Kenny Pickett, you know, the first quarterback <laughs> taken in the draft and a first rounder. Um, so we understood we wanted to probably be a pass first, run second. I don't know if we ever got to the run second because Kenny was so good throwing the <laughs> ball. But, uh, you know, that, that lacked a little development for offense line. So we're trying to work on that. Uh, we've not been a good run team for the last three years, and, and that's something that needs to change. I think anytime you can run the football, it changes games. You know that in your days at Alabama. When you can run the ball, it surely makes it a little easier as a quarterback to throw the football. And, and could we could have made it even easier on Kenny Pickett. So we want to try to get to that, whether we'll get to that or not, because uh, we're going to be really strong you know, throwing the football as well. Uh, so I feel good with our passing game. We've had that in the past. We'll have it again. But we'd like to be two-dimensional. I'd like to have a run game to lean on as well. Uh, not just on our pass game. And I think to, to win another championship, we're going to have to run the ball a little bit better than we did a year ago. What does balance look like for you, Coach? I mean, in the modern day, especially in the ACC, with all the great quarterback play that you'll see throughout your schedule, so many teams bring one back, so many teams have explosive offenses. Is it realistic to be balanced at 50-50 here in 2022? No, I don't think it is. You know, it's probably going to be a 60-40, and I can't tell you what the 60 is. You know, I think it <laughs> depends on what they want to defend. And You know, I think a defense dictates what you're going to do. Um, you know, our defense is going to dictate you try to throw the ball 60-40, okay, or 70-30. Uh, we're going to try to load the box and make you be that, um, you know, and see what offenses want to do. They Do, do they want to try that? We're going to have our change up to try to, you know, protect ourselves in the pass game. So, you know, I think it depends on what a defense is going to give you. Um but there's times, you know, a year ago, you know, and I, again, that's why I think Kenny Pickett is so good is that people knew we were going to throw the ball and he still was able to complete passes. That was the most impressive thing. I don't think people look at that 
uh, as far as just what a team was giving us. At times they were giving us the run game and we didn't take it. And we still went into the, the teeth of, you know, what someone wanted to do is, is, is defend the pass and, and blitz you. Uh, but Kenny was still able to make plays. So, you know, this year I would say when you look at game plan wise, we're going to take more advantage of what you're trying to do pre-snap, post-snap. Uh, we're going to, we're going to try to, you know, give our offense a chance to, to go against something that uh, gives them more opportunity in the run game and pass game. And I remember vividly, my, my last college game was against you. Uh, you were the defensive coordinator at Michigan State at the time. And I remember vividly as we prepared for that game, Jim McElwain, our offensive coordinator, said, hey, Mark, to Mark Ingram and to Trent, Trent Richardson, said, hey, if you guys run for 100 100- yards against this guy and this defense in particular keep the football because he will not let you run the football (laughs) so you have long prided yourself in trying to neutralize that part of the opposing offense and I I don't know how you do it coach but you're one of the best that's done it in quite some time and have been doing it for gosh I don't want to make you feel old or anything but it's been a while uh so that's I remember that game too I remember that pregame I'll never forget the pregame of that game you know we're on the road we're in Orlando correct (laughs) <laughs> right, right. That's right. We were in we're Orlando. We're in Orlando. I think was, it, was it the Champs Bowl? You guys were a little disappointed with Ingram, and you know, I think Saban, Saban had you guys a little angry going into that game. But uh, I think you ran the ball as well as throwing it. You had this big wide out that you moved in the slot at one point. But pregame, we were beating pregame <laughs> when all they did was play Sweet Home Alabama. I was like, are we? You know, are we in Tuscaloosa? Or, or, you know, <laughs> is this a neutral game here? Because it certainly wasn't neutral uh, at the beginning of the game, and, and it certainly wasn't neutral during the game. You guys. You know, we had a good football team with Kirk Cousins, and uh, you know I had I had a coach tip us tip us off that I talked to and said, "Hey, whatever you do, don't line up and empty because Saban will have a blitz check and he'll he'll hit your quarterback and he'll knock him out." Kirk Cousins got knocked out that day, and that was that was critical. What we do? we lined up and empty. Wasn't very smart on our part. <laughs> now we slipped the PA a hundred uh, to make sure that you played Sweet Home Alabama uh, on on repeat that day. Now it was uh, it was a fun game, Coach, and I've always had respect for you ever since that point because of how difficult the looks were and, and knowing you guys knew where you were strong and you played to your strengths. Uh, speaking of quarterbacks, um, you have a quarterback competition that's ongoing. Got one guy that we know an awful lot about in in Keaton Slovis, knowing that he's played for quite a while at SC and now he's at your place uh, along with some other guys that we're not as familiar with so help us understand what you're looking for from that position and if you'd like to name a starter on our show you're more than welcome yeah we're, we're not ready to do that at this point uh <laughs> but we've got really you know two guys that are battling out that quarterback keaton slows as you mentioned uh a kid that you know was here for spring ball he's done an outstanding job he's a you know he's a tremendous person um you know i just like how he he presents himself every day in our in our offices in our meeting rooms and on our field uh he leads the right way and then the other guy's uh, Nick Patty, who played in the first series, I guess first two series of the uh, of our Peach Bowl uh, loss. And if he plays the entire game, I've said this, I think he's he's a he's a great quarterback and a guy that we can win a lot of football games with. So Nick Patty's a competitor, he's a leader. Um, you know, he does it a little bit different way. Uh, so we'll have two different game plans based on who you know who is in the game this season. Um, and uh, Nick Nick's a tough guy that's going to scramble and, and find a way to get it done one way or another. Yeah, I'm excited to see whoever it is. I, I know whoever it is, the relationship that he'll have with Frank Sinetti, who I have just a tremendous amount of respect for. I played for Kurt, so I know that family well and think he did a great job at BC in recent years and know he'll do a great job for you. Moving to the defensive side of the ball, your expertise, uh, a lot of familiar faces up front. Um, but structurally, do you anticipate being different this year or is it going to be much of the same? You know, you know, I've been running this defense and, and Randy Bates runs our defense, but it's really, you know, uh, something, you know, we came up years and years and years ago, um, but been coordinating, coordinating the defense, uh, or at least this type of defense since 2003 at Miami, Ohio, um, at the Division One level, and then on to Cincinnati, Michigan State and here. Um, what we do is what we do. We're going to have different tweaks every week. We're going to have different tweaks based on what we're facing, you know, especially with the RPOs. And we've done some things in the offseason to, to take care of those uh, issues that you might have in the RPOs with, with our base quarters. So we've got a lot of different tweaks that we put in. Um, you know, we got to do a good job mixing it up and changing it up on different people, but we're going to be who we are. It's won us a lot of football games through the years. And I'm a firm believer if you stop the run and make a team one dimensional, you got a chance. So Randy Bates, our defensive staff, you know, Charlie Partridge, Ryan Manilac, uh, Corey Sanders and Archie Collins do a great job uh, of different, you know, different techniques and things that we're doing schematically. Uh, they tweaked it through the, you know, through the last really five years as far as what we do. And 
um, we've got our base and then we've got all the different things that we'll branch off into. Yeah, I'm excited to see what you guys look like on that side of the ball. I think you got some dudes that can flat out get after you. Uh, and as a quarterback, I'd be a little concerned facing that front four uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, Hey, look, we know who's week one. We know at this point of fall camp, you're focused on you as you should be competitions, getting better player development, et cetera. But let's not ignore the elephant in the room. The backyard brawl returns. Uh, and we're all happy as fans of college football with realignment. We've lost some of these historically great rivalries. So have you noticed a different sense of urgency amongst your team, knowing that who's going to be there that first Thursday when you guys tee it up? Yeah, I think they certainly know, and I think they knew through June and July that we were opening up with a cupcake. Uh, it's a really, really good Big 12 football team in, in West Virginia. It's going to come into Accusure Stadium on September 1st, and, and our guys will be ready. I think, that, you know, they're embracing the rivalry. They understand what it is. They understand they're just down the road, and, and uh, you know, they'll come in here. They're, they're tough. Uh, they're physical, and, and they're, they, they will be scrappy, and, um, you know, it's going to take every every bit of – you know, energy and, and effort and passion that we have here at Pittsburgh to beat them that day. And yeah, coach, you've been a part of, of rivalries at Pitt. Um, obviously the Penn state game that you guys have played a few times, not, not recently, but uh, a handful of years ago. Um, you know, what do these games mean to you as a coach uh, knowing that obviously it clearly means an awful lot to your fan base? Yeah. I mean, it, it becomes personal. I think, you know, first of all, you know, I think the Panther nation, you know, would like to be West Virginia. Uh, there's some disrespect, you know, from down south that I think the Pitt fans feel uh, through the years, um, whatever it may be, uh, whether it's happening in the stands, happening as you walk in the stadium or happen, happening as you drive into the stadium, uh, whether it's in Pittsburgh or down in Morgantown. So I think our fans are passionate about it. They felt it in the past. Uh, I've been, you know, a part of a bunch of great robbers through my career. And, and uh, it becomes personal for your family. It becomes personal for every coach on our staff. Our kids, you know, we'll, we'll embrace that rivalry. I, I really do think there's some, you know, some rivalries. And I'll go back to, you know, you know, what really hit me, um, you know, as as a as a Michigan State coach was when we got beat by Michigan in our first year there. You know, Chad Henningham to Mario Manningham on a, on a last second pass to beat beat us. And uh, the the next day in school, you know, all my you know four children had to take it, um, you know, because you know they were in English class or science class or. Uh, or phys ed and, and the topic of the day was how did how did Michigan State lose that game um, and it became personal and I said I'm not gonna do that to my wife and kids ever again um, because it was it was you know abuse of the next day in school uh, it was not kind and and I didn't appreciate that by any of the teachers that day and I you know I won't appreciate it today you know so we have to protect our backyard we got to protect Pittsburgh we got to protect our families every every game we step out on the field now you, you anticipate that game being pretty physical or you know, it is the backyard brawl after all. Oh. It will be physical. We'll, you know, uh, we, we will make it physical. That's that's uh, the brand of football we play here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, you, I, I've always been in line, Coach, that a team that has won a championship before can do it again. Uh, Pitt has obviously won championships, a proud tradition, but it's been a little while since you guys have won the, the national championship. Now, hey, you took a huge step last year and you were oh so close to making it to the playoff, what have you. But is it more difficult in the modern era now to win a national championship? Or does the NIL regulation, does that help you in some ways to get back to the top of college football? You know, what? I, you know, I always say this to our players, you know, name, image, and likeness is great. And we want our kids to get paid, but you know, if you're you're a player out there and you're going to a school because you're getting paid and you're getting this much as opposed to what you're getting over here, then you made a mistake. And we're going to just see that portal continue to grow. You know, I think it comes down to, you know, who are you playing with and are you happy where you are? Uh, I'm sure in your years at Alabama, you had no regrets because you were there and you walked through those doors to go to work every day and you're happy. Uh, if you walk through those doors and you're making a lot of money, and you're unhappy, you're not going to be very successful and you'll underachieve academically and you'll underachieve athletically, you better be happy walking the building. So we always think it's about people here at Pittsburgh and I want our guys to be happy. That's why we've been, you know, uh, pretty fortunate to keep, you know, 99% of our players staying here at Pitt. You know, Kenny Pickett comes back for another year. We got an entire offensive line says, hey, I want to come back for another year. Carter Ward, our left tackle, has a chance to go to the combine, has a chance to go to uh, to Mobile and senior bowl and says, nah, I think I'm going to wait another year. I want to play at Pittsburgh. And I think it's all about the people. Carter Warren didn't get a big payday to come back for another year. Some booster didn't come in and say, hey, this is what we're going to pay. He had it in his heart to play here in Pittsburgh and play for the staff and play with his teammates. And I think that's what's important. It's about the people. So uh, I don't know if it makes it any harder. I mean, the teams get harder. 
Um, you know, you play with different players every year. So you know, when you lose some players, you got to replace some players. And uh, but you know, that's that's our job as coaches is to continue to recruit on a daily basis to to replenish those recruits and and then get our kids to play their hearts out for us and, and make sure we have a great game plan uh, when we walk out on the field on a Thursday night or a Saturday night. Now you uh, you have one of the most unique settings for practice and for player development as anybody you shared the facility with the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, Mike Tomlin's dealing with guys getting paid every single week uh, do you ever kind of lean on him on how to deal with the changing environment knowing that we are transitioning just a little bit more towards a pro model as compared to the traditional college model that we've all grown up in you know I have not you know he's a busy man I'm a busy man it is outstanding, you know, practicing at the safe facility. Obviously, they're in Latrobe, but they did pop back in here the other day. Latrobe got flooded out, so they came back to, to Pittsburgh to practice, you know, right out my windows here. So uh, I have not talked to them about it because it's such a totally different situation. I mean, they're getting paid millions. Uh, everybody's on a, on a contract. You know, we don't have contracts here in college football. Um, so I think it's a totally different deal. And I, like I said earlier, I truly believe, you know, until we get to a model where it is, you know, amateur, you know, uh, or pro football, you know, in an amateur, I guess, version of it, uh, semi-pro, whatever you want to call it. Until we get to that point, it's it's really not the same. Um, and I think, we, you know, we've got to play it that way. I think it comes down to college football, and that's kind of how we're still playing here in Pittsburgh. Our kids are going to make their money. You make your plays, you're going to make your money, um, and, and, and you're going to get your name, image, and likeness. And that's what we want. I mean, Kenny Pickett had a heck of a deal, and we want to make sure all of our guys have that. All right, Coach, finally, we'll get you out of here. We always do a big gotcha question to put you on the hot seat. Are you comfortable with that? Bring it on. It's got you every day. <laughs> All right. All right. You get – I got to throw my guy in here, Matt Cavanaugh. You get Matt Cavanaugh, Kenny Pickett, or Dan Marino to go out and win one game for you as the head coach of the Pitt Panthers. Who do you want? Man, I love all those guys. You put me – that's a gotcha question right there for sure. Because I got so much respect for all three of those guys, um, I'm going to take Dan Marino in the first quarter. Okay, I'm going to take um, yeah. Kevin on the second quarter. I'm going to take a picket in the third quarter. I'm going to see who played the best, and then they're going to take over the fourth quarter. And we're going to beat everybody. <laughs> I like that. I can get on board with that. It sounds like the second quarter you're going to lean heavily on the run because that's what Cav yeah. had to ride his hey, route to we, a national championship. We need to so. establish that run game. I told you so. But you know, we'll take whatever we can get. Absolutely, man. Can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Congrats on a great 2021. And we look forward to seeing what you can do as an encore here in 2022. We appreciate that, Greg. And, and thanks for having us on. Today. All right. That was a great visit with Pat and Arduzzi. They're the defending ACC champ. And they're the seventh different team to represent the Coastal in the ACC championship game since 2013. They're trying to become the first to defend as champ since Virginia Tech did it a million years ago, it feels like. But I think there's actually going to be significant competition coming out of that division. I think it's one of the more improved divisions in college football here heading in to this year. Let's look at a couple teams that might have something to say about Pitt's trip back to the ACC championship. Let's start with the U. All right, bad news, good news. We've been doing this for a couple of days. Let's keep it going there. We'll start with the bad news. The conversation about Miami is, is the U back? Well, I loved what Mario Cristobal had to say about it. He said, well, the U is back to work. That's what they have to do. Look, Miami's had one 10-win season in 18 years. They've had one bowl win since 2006 and has yet to win the ACC since they joined the league. Well, in steps Mario Cristobal, who already has multiple conference championships under his belt at Oregon. He's got a Rose Bowl win. He's got a 10-year contract, and it feels like he's got an unparalleled track record as a recruiter. But that doesn't happen overnight. You can't wave the magic wand as a recruiter and as a program builder and all of a sudden expect your team to take the next step. So the conversation centering around, is the U back? The answer is no. The U is en route to being back. I really believe that. The biggest, the other big question for me when it looks at Miami is that the best teams are built from the inside out. Well, why is it that Miami has struggled along the offensive line for the better part of the last decade? Maybe even longer if you want to dive a little bit deeper. Well, the good news is that you have now hired one of the best offensive line coaches in America who at the same time will be building your program. And it feels like a little bit when you look at Miami's offensive line this year, they've been a little bit of a liability recently. There's no denying that they've been an issue for the better part of the last several years, but 
it does feel like they have some talent coming back. So there's reason to think that they're going to take the next step. And then what do you think also when you think about Miami? I think about a great front seven defensively, right? All the great teams in the early 90s and the early 2000s, they had great personnel along the line of scrimmage defensively. Well, if you look at what they have right now, heading into last year and even into this year, the front seven defensively has not been what they've been in the past. You got to replace a couple key pieces along the defensive front. But another thing is that when you look at the linebackers, man, they missed a million tackles last year. Really, throughout the course of the entire season, I called the Michigan State game. It was as if Michigan State, their entire body was covered in Vaseline because Miami defenders are just slipping right off as would-be tacklers. They got to get that side figured out. Those are the three things that were bad news. But how about the good news? One, you know you have a great quarterback. Tyler Van Dyke, with what he did down the stretch last year, in his final six games, his worst passing performance included 316 yards and three touchdowns. Worst passing performance. I'd say it's a pretty good place to start. Think about the fact that he outdueled Kenny Pickett en route to a victory. You think about his coming out party against NC State, where he had four touchdowns in the upset. He might be poised to take a huge leap here as the unquestioned starter heading in to 2022. Offensive firepower, a little bit of a question at the top. Charleston Rambo, after what was an amazing year, he's now in the NFL. But... You look at what they have at wide receiver and what they have at tight end. There's reason to believe there are so many pieces that might step up. You hear names like Jacoby George, who feels poised to jump. You think Frank Ladson, who's a transfer from Clemson. He might be poised to jump. Restrepo's back. Will Mallory's back. You have good pieces there at wide receiver. Just not sure exactly what the pecking order is going to be because it doesn't appear, at least right now, like there is that Charleston Rambo bona fide alpha dog number one wide receiver. So they got to figure that out in fall camp. The good news is they have plenty of pieces to decide from. And finally, the best news, I think, for Miami this year, you have two phenomenal coordinators. Josh Gaddis, we've talked about him in previous episodes, what he's going to do to the offense, probably going to pick up. If you look at the offense last year, they were not a problem. They were able to do an awful lot of good things. Now they got to be able to run the ball. They got to do better in that regard. But all things considered, the offense has been rock solid. Well, Josh Gaddis going to pick up from where Rhett Lashley left it. He's now the head coach at SMU. Rhett Lashley had things humming a little bit offensively there down the final stretch of the season. Gaddis steps in, going to put his own fingerprints on what they want to be offensively by using the RPO, by mixing in the run game, by being committed to the run game, hopefully with an improved, a different mentality physically along the offensive line. I think this offense has a chance to be just as good, if not better in a lot of ways, than last year. And then defensively, Kevin Steele steps in a little bit different from that of what Manny Diaz did in the past. Manny Diaz wants to make it helter-skelter, wants to throw a bunch of pieces at you, throw a bunch of pressures at you, and just cause a lot of communication issues, cause a lot of confusion amongst opposing offenses. Kevin Steele wants to be a little bit more predictable, a little bit more by the book. And if you look at his stops in the past, whether it be at Clemson, at Florida State, at Auburn, at Alabama, the guy has always been very sound defensively. You know that group's going to play well, and if they can have some pieces step up in the front seven, they'll be in great shape to, I think, be in the top half at very worst in the ACC defensively. Hopefully, they'll be much better than that. Maybe a top two or three unit by the time the season comes to a close. So that team was close last year, but do they have enough to get over the hump? Those are some of the reasons why they may or may not close the gap with the Pitt Panthers. I'm going to hit you with a whoa Nelly here on Miami, Greg. Whoa, Nelly. I like Miami. I like that they're rebuilding, but they play at a and I know that's not going to be a big influence on the conference schedule, but they end the season against Florida State, at Georgia Tech, at Clemson, and Pitt. Say they lose that a and game. I mean, are you telling me that Miami is going to garner enough momentum to win three out of four of those games down the stretch? Well, three out of four will be a a tall order. Feel good about their matchup against Georgia Tech. I think Pitt will be a difficult one, naturally, as we've already discussed what Pitt is earlier in the show. I think Florida State's got a chance to take a huge step. And hey, Clemson, man, 
it's no, it's a tough ticket. I mean, Clemson, I think, is the best team in the ACC based on what they bring back, and hopefully a boost at the quarterback spot with DJ Uwe Ungalale, or if it's not him, Klubnik. We'll see who exactly how that all unfolds is TBD. But in a coastal division that could very easily see a little bit of self sabotage, where teams are losing games they shouldn't. Maybe Miami finds their way to the very top. I think their schedule's tough. There's no denying that Miami has a very difficult schedule. It's extremely difficult. But they do have the pieces to build, to make me believe that they could take a huge step forward. Now, that's based on a couple assumptions. Front seven defensively has to be better. Got to tackle better. Got to block better. Shoot, man, that offensive line has been an underachiever for as long as I can remember. So yeah, I feel great about the quarterback. I feel great about the weapons. I think they'll be good at running back. I think they'll be good in the perimeter defensively. But Will they be good enough in the trenches is, I think, the biggest difference between what Miami, when they're at their best, that's where they're at. They have unbelievable pieces along the offensive line and the defensive line. Well, Miami is a far cry from that right now. But I need to make sure that Miami falls under the same umbrella as some of the other teams that have done and created some goodwill on the recruiting trail. You got to separate the recruiting trail from where they're at right now. While they have momentum in their program, the hiring of Dan Radakovich, an athletic director, that proves to be a significant commitment. The money that seems to be rallying in the NIL and all the things that are surrounding Miami that feel very positive. Mario Cristobal choosing to leave Oregon, a place that was established and ready to compete for conference championships, to go home and press the reset button on a program that really wasn't that far away last year. There's a lot to feel good about the momentum that's been created. But will it pay dividends in 2022? It's a little bit difficult for me to project. I don't think they can necessarily overtake that of Pitt or Clemson, for that matter. I think Miami is still a year away. But when you fast forward into 2023, 2024, 2025, etc., cetera, it'll feel, I think, like the Miami that we grew up with. Maybe not the dominance that was on display in the early 2000s or the late 80s. Maybe not that level of dominance. But I'd be surprised if we went more than a year or two without them always being in contention, not just to win the ACC, but to potentially punch their ticket to the college football playoff. All right, another team that could be very much in the mix. A lot of people thought they were the team to beat last year. They started the season number 10 in the country, and they fall flat very quickly. That would be the North Carolina Tar Heels. Look, I know that the rest of you guys are thinking, well, North Carolina, goodness gracious, how can you possibly feel good about what they have this year? They just lost a great quarterback. I understand that. Just hear me out for a half second, okay? North Carolina, we're going to do good news, bad news. We'll start with the bad news. They were horrendous on the road last year. Horrendous. They were a cool 0-6 away from Keenan Stadium last year. And the bad news is they have a couple really difficult road games that they need to take into account scattered throughout their schedule. You go to Appalachian State on September 3rd. You think App State's going to be fired up for that one? Yeah, I think that's a safe assumption. I believe Boone has already started the party to welcome the Tar Heels to their hometown. That place is going to be going absolutely bananas. They're a huge opportunity to play an in-state school, a team that you would consider a rival, but a team that might look down their nose at you. I think App State will have their ears pinned back to play hard in that one. You follow that game with a road trip to Georgia State, who's one of the better teams in the Sun Belt this year. Two difficult non-conference games for North Carolina. You couple that with you have road games to Miami, to Virginia, and Wake Forest. That's a pretty tough road slate for North Carolina. You also, of course, here's the other bad news, and I don't think I need to spend a ton of time on this because everybody that's watching this show is familiar with what North Carolina had at quarterback the last couple of years. Sam Howell was a one-man show at times over the last handful of seasons. Yeah, they've had good run game. They've had good personnel at wide receiver. They've been able to do some things offensively, but they haven't been able to do as much without him at the helm. Him being gone is a significant loss. And knowing that you have to replace him with inexperienced players like Jacoby Criswell or Drake May, I think both those guys are talented. Drake May, I believe, was like a five-star player coming out of high school. And he's, you know, all world as far as potential is concerned. I think Criswell looked good in the spring game too. So Phil Longo, the offensive coordinator, is going to have his hands full trying to replicate the productivity that he got from Sam Howell, not just through the air, but also with Sam Howell did with his legs. He was a willing runner. He was a capable runner. And quarterback run game was a big part of what they were offensively throughout the course of the last few seasons. So those are the two things that are the bad news for North Carolina this year. 
Here's the good news. They're stacked at running back and they have a superstar at wide receiver. Let's start with the wide receiver. Y'all, Josh Downs set a ton of records last year. And as the top weapon, he immediately is going to garner a lot of attention with bracket coverage, double coverage, knowing what he's capable of. The guy will take the game over in a heartbeat. And if your defense allows him to, then shame on you because you know right now that's the weapon that could win the game for the Tar Heels. The good news is because of his movement, because of his run under catch, because of his versatility outside, in the slot, out of the backfield, you might be able to move him around within the offense to allow for more favorable matchups. Expect Downs to be a huge part of what they do offensively from start to finish, regardless of who the quarterback is. But hopefully there's another guy or two that step up alongside Josh Downs to make sure that he's not a one-man show. And then at running back, you have a lot of really good pieces. I've read in some publications, they feel good about at least six of their running backs. That's right, six. I can't envision a scenario where six guys are splitting carries in a running back by committee approach. That seems like a lot. But if they can narrow it down to say three, where guys have actual roles, maybe one guy's downhill, one guy's a slasher, one guy's your pass catching option. Maybe your one guy is going to be able to get the tough yardage in short yardage and goal line situations. Having six guys, several of which have different skill sets, I think is very valuable to Phil Longo and what they want to be offensively. Here's the second reason why I feel great about North Carolina taking a step this year. Gene Chizik. If you know that name, if you're a North Carolina fan, if you're an Auburn fan, if you're a Texas fan, if you're an SEC fan, if you're an Iowa State fan, shoot, he's been all over the place. But Gene Chizik has at times been as good of a defensive mind in college football as anybody. And if you look at what he did in his previous stop at North Carolina, he got there in 2015. Look at North Carolina statistically in 2014 on the defensive side. And then look at what they did in 2015. And I'll remind you, that 2015 team, and believe me, I was as shocked as you were watching it. That North Carolina team in 2015 was an onside kick away from winning the ACC and keeping Clemson out of the college football playoff. That's how good that team was. And it was in large part due to the improvements they made on the defense side of the football with who? Gene Chizik at the helm. He's going to make sure that that defensive line that brings an awful lot of pieces back, Miles Murphy in particular in the middle of that defense, he's going to be freed up to be able to create favorable matchups in the pass rush against their weakest pass-blocking offensive linemen. You look at some guys that might be able to play a huge role. They have a trio of edge rushers that might be able to take the next step in this defense. They're not going to do a ton of pressures. They're not going to do a ton of blitzes. They're not going to do a lot of that stuff. He's going to let the game come to him. Gene Chizik's very patient defensively. So I think them just being collectively a little bit more sound will make this group a whole lot better. Y'all, they've stockpiled talent on the defensive side. They've recruited well, and there are a bunch of guys that are now in year three in the system. So you got to think, when is this group going to come around? Maybe it's in 2022. And then final reason why I feel pretty good about North Carolina this year is that nobody's talking about them. Nobody's talking about them. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. And last year, when everybody and their brother wanted to anoint North Carolina as the team of 2021, they went out week one of the season against Virginia Tech and got punched in the face. And if you listen to Mac Brown throughout the course of his interviews in the offseason, including one with us here on Always College Football, he said, we didn't practice like the number 10 team in the country. We didn't play like the number one 10 team in the country. We had way too many guys that were reading their press clippings and didn't understand what it would take to be successful and to prepare like a championship caliber football team. Translation, they were immature. And now that nobody's talking about North Carolina, that young group can put a chip on their shoulder and say, hey, man, last year was a fluke. We're coming out and we're going to take some names along the way. Maybe, just maybe, that lack of attention will help them play better throughout the course of the season. I'm cautiously optimistic about Miami. I'm cautiously optimistic about North Carolina. And of course, you know I feel good about what Pitt brings back given all the pieces and all the experience they gained from the 2021 season. 
That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Please like, rate, and subscribe wherever it is you're getting the content. We really appreciate it. It helps us out. It helps the show out. So we look forward to our future interactions with you. You can email the show at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. You can hit us up on social media, on Instagram, and on Twitter at alwayscfb. For all of us here at Always College Football, he's Mark Kubiak. I'm Greg McElroy. Hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.